So to close the lecture on sustainability, I want to look at one project in particular that spoke really not only to how far the, the kind of discipline of uh, energy efficiency in buildings had come uh, by, the, by the mid 1990s, but also the role it had begun to play in social and even cultural uh, discourse. The project was the uh, revitalization of the Reichstag building in Berlin, Germany. Uh, to, as, as part of the reunification, the German government wanted to relocate uh, back to Berlin uh, from Bonn. Uh, and the Reichstag, of course, had a long and, and tortured uh, history. In particular, it was symbolic both of the, the, uh, the beginning of World War II and, and of the, the end. The fact that Germany went uh, abroad for uh, an architect to revitalize it was particularly meaningful. And Foster and Partners, the firm that had done the Commerce Bank and had done some of the really early uh, high-tech, sustainable uh, designs in places like uh, Stansted and, and Duisburg and Frejus, was selected in part because of their vision for the building really as a, a kind of engine, an energy supplier, or at least a, a kind of energy focus for the, for the city. Their initial scheme was to treat the building almost as a museum piece and to put it essentially in a, a glass vitrine. Um, this was seen as both kind of culturally appropriate, right, treating this, this relic as a, uh, a, a, an artifact uh, a, in, the, in, in the condition that, that it was in. Um, but Foster's also, along with this, proposed a, a few sort of small ideas that would uh, make the building uh, an energy efficient parliament building lighting uh, in, in particular. There was a lot of discourse about replacing the dome of the Reichstag. And over the course of a year and something like 200 uh, attempts at finding both the right shape and the right configuration, um, the firm settled on uh, a glass dome that would reflect both the kind of transformation of the building, uh, but also to Foster's mind, the idea of transparency, that the Reichstag would be uh, a place where the government was on display. Uh, and maybe most importantly, the glass dome would function as a, a, a ventilation device. It would be the, the, the environmental system uh, for the entire building. The glass dome that was ultimately put on top of the new parliament chamber was designed with a giant frenal mirror, uh, a mirror whose geometry was derived from lighthouse design that would bring in horizon light and redirect it directly down to the, the chamber below. Um, horizon light, of course, is always blue sky. It's only at the very sunrise and sunset that you get direct uh, sunlight. So bringing in light horizontally from the, the edges of the sky dome uh, is always going to be uh, reasonably efficient. You bring in daylight without the, the solar gain that you get from, from direct sunlight. Beyond that, though, the dome was also intended as a, a, a ventilation device. So the glass of the dome uh, was designed very much like the solar chimneys that we've seen to heat up to exhaust air through the top and to draw uh, air through the, the fabric of the, of the building uh, itself. Here uh, in section, you can see that there's an observation ramp that, that climbs the dome. So uh, the, the, the visitors to the Reichstag, the people are put above the parliament, uh, a, a, an architectural statement that of course had political uh, implications. And once you're inside, you see that you can look down both into the parliament chamber uh, on the right, but you can also look out uh, over the city. And the frontal uh, mirror uh, you see on the left, bringing in again that horizontal uh, daylight, directing it down so that the chamber kind of glows uh, below. It was the uh, environmental uh, performance of the dome, though, that, that attracted the most uh, interest. Um, because the, the dome was actually ventilating the, the parliament uh, chamber, uh, the parliament chamber was then, would then draw air through the thick masonry walls of the original building, uh, and, and cool tempered air would come in to replace the air that was being exhausted from the, from the top. You can see in the diagrams below that the offices around the perimeter uh, were retrofitted with windows 
that worked on this double skin principle so they could be closed up in the winter to provide insulation, uh, opened in a variety of ways in the summer depending on how warm it was outside to either bring in a cool air or to exhaust uh, to ventilate the offices uh, if, uh, um, when, they, when, they, when they got too hot. Maybe most interesting though uh, was a kind of um, unintended effect, which was that the when at night when Parliament was in session and the artificial lights would be turned on, the Pranal lens worked in reverse. It worked exactly like a lighthouse and kind of illuminated the the skyline of Berlin uh, beyond. The actual impact, of course, of any one building isn't so great. The uh, Reichstag being a, a heavy masonry building would have benefited from thermal mass anyway. But the implications of a, a major government taking its parliamentary building and using renewable energy, using passive ventilation uh, to power it was really profound and really made a statement about how the entire country of Germany was committed and remains to this day one of the leading, uh, one of the leading countries uh, in trying to address the problems of energy consumption, uh, carbon footprint, uh, and therefore climate change that, that we're all faced with today. Alongside all of these very interesting kind of performance uh, techniques was a growing realization that embodied energy is one of the major issues that we have to deal with uh, as a building uh, species uh, as well. And that a lot of the materials that we've gotten very used to using, uh, aluminum in particular, but also steel, glass, uh, and even to some extent timber, um, has a tremendous amount of embodied energy per pound. These are a little bit deceptive. We can do a lot more with a pound of aluminum or a pound of steel than we can, of course, with a pound of concrete. But nevertheless, it shows that a lot of the materials that we think of as high tech or high performance are actually incredibly toxic from an ecological point of view. And in addition to the, the kind of big statements about passive ventilation that the projects like Commerce Bank made, was a growing realization that all of the steel that goes into building a, a building like Commerce Bank or all of the glass and aluminum that goes into some of the double skins that we've seen brings with it a, a really heavy price uh, as well as the, the, the alongside the performance uh, that it provides. We begin to see, especially uh, in, the, in the first years of the 21st century, more and more of an interest in embodied energy and looking in particular at the, the amount of carbon that it takes to extract materials that we're used to working with uh, and, and to, to get them to the job site to fabricate them. We've begun to see a, a, a much kind of richer balance between how buildings perform uh, and how they're assembled. And in some ways, we've gone back to efforts to bring simpler, more renewable materials like timber uh, into our, back into our, our, our building palette. We've also seen somewhat less interest, but nevertheless uh, important advances in thinking about how buildings can be recycled at the end of their lives. So are we using materials in a way that allows, for instance, the steel and aluminum, the, the, the really heavy embodied energy prices that we pay, that allows those materials to be taken out of the building uh, and used again uh, somewhere else? Here from the, the New Buildings Institute, we see uh, a, a way of thinking about building beyond what we've typically done. From the 1970s to about 2000, I think we were mostly thinking about energy consumption in the, the green area. Um, how we use it, how we maintain it, how much energy we use, maybe how much water we use. Today, I think we try to think about a much broader spectrum where we're starting from how the materials that we're using are extracted, how they're manufactured, how they're brought to the site, and more and more what happens when the building reaches the end of its, its useful life. Can we recycle the entire building or can we at least recycle uh, components? The same time that we've gotten very interested in the, the, the kind of fine grain uh, sustainability of building, we've also, I think, expanded our scope as builders and started to think about those networks in particular that we talked about uh, a few weeks ago that went to support and, uh, that went to support internal combustion technologies uh, and rethinking how those have contributed to a lifestyle that is not literally sustainable. And there are any number of charts like this that talk about the, the urban density versus the amount of fuel that, that cities use. 
And if you look closely, you can see that there's a direct correlation between the density of people and the, the um, or an inverse correlation, sorry, between the density of people and the amount of energy it takes to make those cities work. All of the cities in the upper left uh, are American, North American. Uh, Houston, Phoenix, Detroit, Denver are the worst. We think of those as really reliant on automobiles. You can see that they're even worse than Los Angeles, sort of the stereotypical uh, automobile city. But even denser American cities like Boston or Chicago or New York uh, are profoundly more energy intensive than most of our European counterparts. Europe, you can see down in the, the kind of crook of the, um, uh, of, the, of the arm and then all the way to the right are cities that are very, very dense, like, like Hong Kong. When we build, we don't just build individual buildings, right? We build networks and we build cities. And how we think about those cities beyond just the, the individual building has become increasingly important. There are lots of thoughts about what happens when we can no longer drive enough to sustain suburbs like you see on the left. But there's also lots of thought about how patterns of urban use contribute not only to excessive energy consumption, but really uh, reinforce uh, economic patterns that, that produce greater poverty uh, and, and greater misery. Those internal combustion technologies that produced such an economic boom and, and such a change in the, the way that America in particularly functioned uh, around the turn of the century have really come back around uh, and are now, I think, seen as, as highly problematic by most of us, that the buildings that we've built are one sort of level of, of being able to address issues of energy usage and climate change, but the networks that those buildings are enmeshed in uh, present a, a whole different scale of, of, of problems. We'll talk in the last lecture about where things stand and how we as professions, architects, engineers, environmentalists, um, have looked at trying to address both these kind of small scale nuts and bolts problems, but also the much larger scale network problems. And I would say that we're at this kind of crossroads that has underlaid a lot of the, the, last, um, the last few weeks of, of lectures, where when we talk about really advanced building, are we talking about higher, faster, stronger, better? Or are we talking about uh, a, a much more nuanced balance taking uh, the resources that we have and that we can renew, and that includes fresh air, that includes fresh water, uh, that includes energy, and are we balancing that against the performance that it takes both to make our economies run, to make our cities work, uh, but also to ensure that those work not just for us, uh, but for our future generations. Those are the topics that we'll finish up with uh, in, the, in the, the final lecture. For the moment, I'll leave you with these two very high-tech uh, pieces of equipment. One, I think, that symbolizes where we've been for most of the course, faster, stronger, taller, uh, and the one on the right, uh, thinking more about something that we can continue, right, that maybe is better uh, instead of just uh, bigger.